India Tutu. She got locked up in the UK. <laughs> we want her to come home. But right now, she's going to be, you know, helping us work some logistics out as she's going to be co-anchoring with Funto right here. I'm speaking live from Nigeria, and I want you to know that the power of God is present here. So I'm going to share briefly, because I know that once Lola starts speaking, they're not going to listen again. Because everybody wants to hear that testimony. How did she do it? So don't worry. You know, you leave the best for the last. So chill. Wait. It's coming. Okay, the glory of the latter days is greater than the former. I want to say thank you to all of you listening on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on, um, on um, YouTube. Um, thank you. So I want to start this year's Woman Connect 2020. The just shall live by faith. This is a... This is a scripture that you find regularly in the Bible. The first occurrence is in Habakkuk chapter 2 and in verse 4. Then you will also see Paul referring to it in Romans chapter 1 verse 17, Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. But today I'm going to walk around the Habakkuk one because I took time to study the book of Habakkuk. I don't know how many times. And I want you to do the same. It's just three chapters and you can do that. And you will be blessed if you do so. Okay? Habakkuk, you won't call him like a prophet like Jeremiah or Micah or Samuel that the Lord will speak to and they will call and declare that message. That was not the case of Habakkuk. Okay? It was not, uh, it, was, it was a praying prophet. And the kind of prayer he was praying was also kind of different. And that's why I chose the life of Habakkuk to be able to explain the just shall live by faith. Okay? The form of the book of Habakkuk. It's a short series of complaints or laments. And I know women in particular, we are conversant with this. Okay? Followed by divine response. That's the only difference. We complain, we talk, but I don't know whether we wait until we get that divine response. And he closes with a hymn of confidence in God's expected victory. And I'm here to tell you, it's okay to complain. But don't just complain. You have to hear what God has to say. And you don't leave that situation until you close with a hymn of joy. So I'm going to share a few things. I always like talking in points so that you can take this home. And I want you to take your pen, take your iPad, take your jotter and note this. Number one, it is okay to ask God hard questions when things are not going as expected. I can say that again. It is okay to ask God hard questions. God, why? Why is it that I've done all these businesses and I'm not prospering? God, what is happening? Why am I not getting what I've asked for? Why? Because Habakkuk asks. I'm going to just use the word of, words of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was conversing with God. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. I like that. Or cry out to you. Violence. But you do not save. He was chatting with God as his father. And this is something you need to start to do. Don't just make it religious, you know, way of like, oh, oh God, before you can talk to him, you have to enter his gates with thanksgiving and then enter his course with praise. They are good things. But how many times, you know, would your child come into the room and in first of all, stay at the door, knock three times and say, daddy, I want to praise you this morning because you are my father. <laughs> Mommy, oh, <laughs> thank you. No, sometimes they just jump in, <laughs> fly onto your bed. This is the relationship I can see. I can see between Habakkuk and God. Say, God, I don't get what is happening. I called you in frenzy. Violence, they're about to attack. You didn't answer. You watch evil. Let me not preempt. Say, destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abound. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This is how Habakkuk was praying, chatting with God. So what do we learn from this? The silence of God is one of the most difficult things that the believer has to contend with. We're talking the just shall live by faith today. Number two, there is only one thing that is worse than the silence of God and the feeling that God is doing nothing. And that is not understanding God when he begins to walk. Not understanding God when he begins to walk. It is important for us to know 
that someone had gone through this and had been through this rough path. So you're not alone. You feel that everything is dark. You seem like you cannot hear him. You can see things are not going on as they should. You can see the evil man thriving. God is, is in control. So the Lord answers when we ask, even though sometimes the response that he gives is not what we want. So this is what we saw in the case of Habakkuk. The Lord actually does answer. But a lot of times we are fixated on the kind of answer that we are expecting. I expect that if I do not have a job, and I have prayed, and I have fasted, and I'm committed to the things of God, if I, supply, if I submit my CV, the automatic response should be that I should get a job. That would be a good father. But if I, I have fasted, I have prayed, I have a good um, degree, and I've submitted my CV, and I still don't get a job, that's kind of not clear. Okay? You know, I, 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 the Lord answered him in 5 and 6, and this is the kind of answer that we are not anticipating. He said, um, Abacuc chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. I'm not sure I want to read it, but let me quickly just jump. Say, God said to Abacuc and said, For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. God said to Abacuc, I'm raising the Babylonians. Who are these Babylonians? Idolatrous nation, incestuous nation, wicked nation, terrible nation, worse than the nation of Judah. He said, I'm going to use this nation, these infidels, I'm going to use them to punish my, my discipline, my own children. How, who does that? That's God, sovereign in all his ways. So when God said that to Abakuk, Abakuk chilled. So when the Lord speaks to you, even if you do not understand what he's saying, what do you do? You chill. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the number two point is, I said number one, what's my number one point? It is okay to ask God Add questions when things are not going as expected. Number two, use your struggles with the problems to go deeper with God, not to withdraw from him. Use your challenge, use your struggles, use your contradictions, use your confusion to go deeper with God. Don't ever allow any situation or circumstance to draw you away from God. God's purpose is bigger than any of us and our problems. So no event or evil person can thwart God's plan. Rather, God uses every situation to fulfill his plan in his timing. I want you to know that. So you use your problem to get close to God. I'm going to tell you a quick story of um, Zechariah in the book of Luke chapter 1. We're not going to turn to it because of time. Zechariah was barren with his wife. They didn't have children. But he was committed to his duties with God. So it was his turn to go into the temple because he was in that, you know, group of people that go to serve at the temple periodically. So he was there doing his work. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Let me tell you this. Zechariah and Elizabeth were barren. It was the will of God to keep them that way. They would not have children until six months to the birth of Jesus. Because way back hundreds of years before Zechariah and Elizabeth were born, God had given a prophet to, to Micah. God had given a prophet, and the, a prophet a word, that somebody will come in the spirit and power of Elijah, and this somebody will be the person to reconcile men to God. He will be the forerunner of Jesus. So God had to position somebody who will be linked with Jesus. John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. So they had to have that connection. He was the bishop of this time. He was the one that understood what the kingdom of God was. And he was the one that was like, you know, repent. For the kingdom of God is here. And he was the one that was the way maker and the forerunner for Jesus. He had already gathered the crowd. He had already wet the ground. That was his purpose. Beloved, you have a purpose in God. God created you for a specific assignment. And so the delay of Zechariah and Elizabeth was divinely orchestrated. Am I talking to someone? So God works to fulfill his purpose in his timing by his own style. You can look at, um, I said prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5 to 6, and look at Luke chapter 1. You can start, you can read the whole of book, Luke chapter 1. But look at verse 17 in particular, where God says, this is the plan and the purpose for this boy that will be born. So have you asked God why you're going through 
what you're going through. Number three, you must learn to wait for an answer. No matter what is happening, God wants to speak. He's a good father. You must learn to wait for an answer. Habakkuk 2.1, it says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to his complaints. Okay, I know God is a good God. You need to settle that. The Bible says, nothing good will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He said, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So God is interested in your well-being. But you need to understand, he is sovereign in all his ways. And we were created not for our pleasure, but for his own pleasure. So you need to understand that it's not about you. It's about God and his purpose. Hello, somebody. So number four point, okay, is, I'm using the story of Habakkuk. Starting from Habakkuk chapter 1, okay? The number four point is, your joy is the custodian of your confidence. What did I say? Your joy is the custodian of your confidence. Don't lose it no matter what. Don't lose it. You know, Habakkuk chapter 3 from verse 7, it says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and field produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice. Don't let anything be bigger than God. The house, the car, the wayward husband, the, 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 I mean, the runaway man, or even the children that are not doing well. Because everything that you're crying about, they will end on this side of heaven. There is something that is more important. You need to, be impo you need, you need to understand that. I, I, would, I would digress a little bit and tell you a story. You know, um, two days ago, precisely, my husband just sent me a note, sent me a, um, an iMessage. Hey, babe, you know, I just remembered. This is the anniversary of my parents' death. I said, seriously? He said, yes. And, you know, I just, you know, had this no, just nostalgic feeling, blah, 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 and was saying all that. S wrote a very beautiful piece. I read it and I was moved. And that went. Today we had about four sessions at the studio. And then he spoke again. I mentioned his dad. Then I was convinced and I asked him, you know what? Do you mind if I share a little bit about your private story? And he said, it is okay if it is going to edify the body. Because we do not live for ourselves. Even your predicament, even your pain, even your shame and your gain, they are all working together. You understand? They are all ingredients in the hands of God. I just told you the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. God needed the barrenness and the delay of Elizabeth. And he needed the purity and the virginity of Mary. All is working together in God's scheme. So I'm talking about the story of my husband. You need to listen to this and get the point. My husband was born in England. In the borough of Kessington. And um, a few... Uh, years after he was born, his parents were studying in England then. Like maybe under three or so. He had to come, they had to send him to Nigeria because they needed to face what they were doing. And you know, raising children, you know, and all that was a bit rough and tough. So he was here growing with his grandparents. And then six years after, the parents now came down to Nigeria. So they now were reconciled with all their children. They had six children. And so for about two years or so or more, a little bit over two years, they were living together, getting to know their parents. Listen attentively. I want you to miss, I don't want you to miss this. When he was 11, his parents were traveling from Lagos to Abeokuta. A police car ran into them and killed both of them the same day. They died in a car accident. So my husband became orphaned with his five siblings, he was 11 plus. I think it sounded like the story of Habakkuk. I mean, God could have protected them. God knew there were six children that would be orphaned that day. The Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. I mean, God could have stopped that driver. God could have told the man not to leave home at that time or to have caused a blockade so that they would not get there. But all that did not happen. They died, both of them the same day. But that is not the story I want to tell you today. Of course, that year, he couldn't even make it to the secondary school. So he lost one year of academics. That is also not the story I'm telling you today. He had to struggle from one I mean, family friend to another. Don't forget that they just came back from England. So nobody even knew what they had, where they have. They had money in England. They have some stuff in Nigeria. All the things were lost. But that is not the story I'm telling you today. I'm going to the story. He was born in England. That is my story. So he went through secondary school. 
and with the hope that, you know what, let me just rough it out to secondary school. I will go back to England. At least I'll be able to thrive, you know, with minimal help over there. But it was difficult because even his uncle, who was help, helping and supporting six years after, also died. Ah, uh ah. -uh. God, two people died. Six years after, another one died. So it was like help was just going away and away and away. So he had to leave early on the grace of God. That pushed him to God early. He gave his life to Christ as a teenager. So he had to learn to connect with the father of fathers himself. So the real thing came alive. God is the father of the fatherless. That came out alive. He was walking that way. I'm moving on to the story. Somebody helped him, got a passport, Nigerian passport. So he could go to England. All these things I'm saying, they, they skip in years. It would take like five years to be able to gather enough money to get a passport. Then another five years to be able to go and apply, maybe for a right of abode or something. Then someone said, you know, this thing is cumbersome here. Let's see how you can get to England. By that time, we were almost getting married. When I met him, what he told me is, oh, we're going, I will be going to England. And I'm like, ah, me, I don't know. Me, I'm just too African and too Nigerian to be doing this England stuff, you know. But, you know, I really like him because he was such a man that loved God. I said, okay, let's see how we can work things out. So, he was able to convince me. So, I got a visitor's visa. You got, you're going to get a right of a boat, and then we go to England. Lo and behold, the whole heaven was shut, and there was no way to make that happen. It didn't work the first month, second month. I got a six-month visa. In the midst of it, by 1993, February, I discovered I was pregnant. So, don't forget I had a visitor's visa. I couldn't make it now because if I go, visitor's visa, I may likely, you know, maybe overstay and then there'll be a problem. And then, because he had told me we were going to England, I had resigned my job. So, we were jobless. We did not get a house. We were squatting. And then, the right of abode failed. And so, that was the beginning of suffering 101. One. We were moving, you know, like um, refugees. You have a way to pack your stuff. I had to tuck in my stomach and package it. Pregnancy that was supposed to be a thing of joy became a thing to be hidden. I wasn't pregnant as a teenager. I was pregnant as a married woman. But I had to package it so that I could look for a job as a pregnant woman. I was able to get a job. And when the nausea comes... I rush to the toilet, vomit, you know, at least you, you have no you're supposed to vomit around your husband, so at least he would do something. No, this one you have to package the vomiting. Go into the toilet with air freshener, vomit the thing, clear it out, spray it, and come back so that your new boss does not find out that you are pregnant. So I was packaging and managing that. That continued. Because now a child has come in. We couldn't even divert all the money we were using and all that to pursue, you know, Going back to England, we had to take care of the child, you know, and that's, you know, like diverted us a little bit. I'm still moving on with the story. Then we like, he finally was able to get a visitor's visa, got to England. His name on the birth certificate was different from the name on the passport. And there were so many other things. It doesn't really matter. Okay, get another passport in the other name. Send it in. By the time they send it in, they query some things. Maybe some people had started using his, his, his passport. We didn't know what was happening behind the scene. But anyway, he didn't get the passport. They said that was too difficult. They make it simple in South Africa. Go to South Africa. We gather money together. He went to South Africa. They were almost at the peak. They called him for an interview. And that was the last phase to be able to issue the passport. Lo and behold, they found out. The date your parents died was 28th of July. The date on the death certificate is different. Somebody must be lying. You know the way we do things in Nigeria. Somebody probably wrote June instead of July. And that was it. So it was assumed that, you know, it was a fraud. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he never, till today, got the British passport. What am I saying? We sat down, we had spent money, time, emotion, energy, we had fasted, we had prayed, we had done all that we knew to do, hoping that this was going to make life easy. At least he would be able to give his children, you know, good education, you know, with minimal cost. That was it. Then we sat down, we looked at ourselves and said, hey, babe, what is happening? He said, we can't continue to do this. Then people will give you all sorts of things. Maybe if you do this, maybe if you do that, then you will start compromising. Then I asked them a question. I said, hey, why really are we pursuing this? Is it people that are born in England alone that succeed? What is it? He said, I just want us to give our children the best education. I said, okay. 
if this is what you want, let us agree together. We held hands and we prayed. We said, if two of us shall agree together as touching a thing on earth, it shall be done by our Father in heaven. And we decided that we God on our side, we will give our children the best education and we would, we would pay international fees and, you know, God would take care of it. And that was the beginning of that journey. I'm here to tell you this. In 2009, our daughter went to England. She started her A-levels, did her first degree in England. Was it rough and tough? It was very rough and tough. Most of the time, we spend almost 70, 80% of our, of our earnings just paying school fees. But we made up our mind. We would give them the best education that we consider the best. And let me tell you this, if you consider um, Unilag the best, give your child. If you consider whatever you consider as the best, that's what you should do. There is no limit. Whatever your heart can conceive, God is able to fund it. And even if circumstances, you know, limit you, God <laughs> is able to open the heavens and to pour you a blessing that you do not have room to contain. We were able to do it and we struggled through it. We struggled through it. And then she graduated. As she was graduating, we were rejoicing. Our son said, mm, not so fast. If you went to England, I got to go to. We already got the cast, you know, and all that. He already gained about three or four, you know, offers from top universities. We were ready. Our faith was building up. Our faith was building up. They said, mom, dad, I don't want to go to England. I want to go to America. We were like, okay, let's look for small, small schools where the tuition is not so much. As we're looking for small, small school, the school was looking for, the, the boy was looking for schools with high, high ranking. And you know, high, high ranking is also high, high money. He didn't understand what was happening to us. The boy was going on. We had already even gotten to school because he had such fantastic score. Where they had given him about $20,000 off as, 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 stu, as um, um, Boswe or what do you call it? Scholarship. Hey, two days to 1st of May. I can't forget. 2014, we got a call. My husband was climbing the step. He got a call from Georgia Tech. Your son is going to receive an email and he must respond within 48 hours. Alas, he wanted Georgia Tech. He applied for early action. They did not take him in early action. They pushed him to regular action. They did not take him regular action. They pushed him to wait list. Anyway, they gave him the admission. We sat with him, wrote him 10 points why he shouldn't go to the school. The boy did not argue with us, but I'm sure he was praying. And God was saying, hey, oh ye of little faith, rise up. I had ordained that this is what is going to happen to this boy. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he graduated from Georgia Tech 2018. That same 2014, our son said, mm, I don't even want to do A-levels. Neither do I want to go to uh, America. I want to go to Canada. Ah, we had taught our children to also be able to know and hear what God wants them to do. And when he was choosing school, he chose a school in the most expensive city in Canada. He went to the University of British Columbia. God was building our work with him. He was stretching our faith. He was making us to agree with him. Whilst that our son that went to U.S. was in secondary school, we felt a need to send him to South Africa, you know, for because we felt it was very English, you know, in this kind of disposition. So we also had, you know, some sting towards South Africa. But then, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we backtracked on that. So we sent one child to, to London. We sent one to America. We sent one to Canada. And today, 2020, all of them have graduated. Our daughter graduated with distinction. Did, did a master's from the University of Cambridge. Our, our, our son graduated with high honors. Our last song that said with distinction, also in chemical engineering. Why did I tell you this story? We were limited by sight, and we felt that England was the ultimate. But God had a deeper purpose. Now I counsel people from all over the world who want their children to go, I mean, to study abroad. Because now I understand the academic structure of South Africa. I understand the academic structure of UK, of Canada, of America, because of the suffering that I went through. The Bible says that you may comfort others by the comfort that you have received. Don't forget that we didn't have a lot of money. So most of the things I have to study, I became an immigration officer myself. I would study all the points, what they're saying. I can't even afford for them to deny because the money that was paid for that application was, you know, last card. But today... It's a story. And I'm sure many of you listening to it are saying, oh, seriously? 
And I'm sure you're saying, I can learn something. Just four days ago, I said I had a Zoom call to a couple that I was trying to share with them what they can do to help their child and how they can position. And I'll say, okay, what is your purpose? What is your goal? What does the child want? Why did I tell you this story? I'm saying it to tell you, to tell something. When the predicament is happening, when the calamity is happening, you think that God has forgotten you, but God has a plan. Say to yourself, God has a plan. The thought that God has towards you, they are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And he says he has tattooed his name. He has inscribed your name in the palm of his hands and he's daily thinking of how to do you good. That is something you need to know. That was what happened to Habakkuk. He said, you know what? Although I do not understand, although the fig tree does not blossom, but I will be confident in one thing. And I will keep rejoicing no matter what. I'm talking the just shall live by faith. I will quickly go, you know, to the last part of my message to tell you how to build your faith in God. How do you build your faith in God? You need to know that. Okay, because Woman Connect 2020 will not be complete until we give you a recipe that you can hold on to. You know, we women, we know we like recipes. You know, you want to make fried rice, you need to get some, you know, spring onion, get some carrot, get some green pepper. The same way, if you want to build your faith, I will tell you what you need to do. Maybe two or three things. But you know, my two or three things always have A, B, C, D under them. Number one, understand that faith works by love. Faith works by love. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. There are only two commandments. You don't need to memorize all the commandments. There are only two. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. Do you want to build your faith? You don't need more than that. Just understand that you need to love God. Philemon chapter 1 verse 5. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. You cannot tell me you have faith and you don't have love. You have to love God. And when you love God, you have to love what God loves. He said, I pray that your partnership with us is the faith in, in I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. I don't understand. You must practice how to love God. You know, when you marry someone, I mean, I see a lot of men. And let me digress to, to the men that are here in Woman Connect. When you want to marry us, you write the poems. You buy the roses. You kneel down to propose. The moment you marry us, you stop doing those things. You learned it. You Googled it. Go and Google again tonight. Because you have to practice how to be romantic. You have to keep practicing how to love. Okay? You're listening to me. Don't just, you know, say finish. Say finish. And women tonight, you also package. You know, all the married men just package somehow, you know. Tuck in that stomach. Don't wear that flabby bra. Square the shoulder. And say like, you know, remember your days, your hair days. You know, and then wear your steels in the room and cut walk a little bit. It's allowed. And feel good. And if you're single, being single is not the end of the world. They're not using marriage as a license to enter heaven. You understand what I'm saying? Stay before the mirror. Say, ah, sekwe, sekwe, figure eight, even if you can't see the eight. Say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, oh God. Look at yourself. Put on a good wig. If you wear wig, and if you don't, you have natural hair, naturalize your hair. Make up without going nowhere. And say to yourself some nice things. Ah, ah, can someone be this good? Are you not God's handiwork? Can God make something that is bad? Make yourself feel good, but love God. And then love your neighbor. A lot of times women don't love themselves. That's why it's difficult for them to actually love God and to love. They, we love activities. We are all in matter ministry. But Jesus said to matter. He said there's something that is important. And Mary has chosen that thing. Drop off a bit of matter and embrace 
Mary attitude, okay? So you need to love God. First, second Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So how do you build your faith? You build your faith by love. Because faith works by love. What are the proofs of my love for God? I'm going to make it really practical because I want you to take something. Don't worry, I'm winding up now. I'm winding up now. What are the proofs of my love for God? You can't tell me you love God and, and it's not tangible. We will see it. Number one, you have to love his word. Faith demands that you tirelessly study the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 97. Women, we love activities. We go to church. We glean the words that drop from the altar. But the woman of faith is a woman that digs into the word by herself. You have to love the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers for I meditate on your statutes. Okay? You need to, all my children, I mean, they, they, they say this offhand because I tell them when they're going to school, you have more knowledgeable than all your teachers because you meditate on the law of God. It is important for you to know. Okay? I have more understanding than elders, for I obey your precepts. Women of God, you need to love the word of God. You need to find a way, you know, to make it work for you. You need to chant it. You need to sing it. You need to wrap it around yourself. You need to keep saying it. You need to keep saying it. You know, in, in 1, Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14, when Samuel went to um, Saul, to tell Saul that he's been rejected. Hear what he said. said, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. God chose Saul and he unchose him and chose David instead because David loved his command. How can you keep a command that you do not know? Women, you need to stay in the word until the word, you need to talk to the word, stay in the word until the word starts talking back to you. You need to stay studying the word until such a time that you will wake up and you will hear a word. You will hear a voice behind you saying this is the way to go. There is no shortcut to walking by faith. You need to love the word. You need to stay in the word. You need to study the word until the word starts talking back to you. Can I hear amen? So, the number two thing, I'm still talking about one point. Faith works by love. And I'm now sharing with you how can you walk in love. One, love the word of God and study it. Number two, give. We quote John 3.16, for God so loved the word that, is, that he gave. You cannot love without giving. It is not possible. It is not possible. Um, let's read. It's a long read. Let me see. Let me paraphrase it. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. From verse, from verse 1, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. You see, I, I told you a story a little bit. I remember those times when things were very tough and when we had to spend all we had, all we had on children's school fees. We were members, we were not pastors, we were members of, church, of, of, of another church. Pastor and I, we sat down together, my husband and I, we said, what do we do? We can't stop giving. It's a command. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. I, I, I see what you believers have turned church to. You wait until the pastor comes to, to tell you something and, and, and um, announce and then give you a promissory note before you start giving. My husband and I decided then, he said, you know, one, we were not salary earners. We were business people and we don't make money like regularly on a daily basis. So we said, and also because we didn't have a lot. We needed to put a sickle to our harvest before the harvest arrived. So we agreed, you know what? Whatever comes in for us, and we did that for almost 15 years. Whatever comes in for us, we're going to set aside 30% of our income. We pay 10% as tight. We pay 10% as offering, and we give 10% as mission support because we love missionaries. We support a lot of mission field, and we kept doing that. Even in the midst of, sometimes when we're done doing it, the only thing that is left is our house rent and our school fees. But we were faithful. But all those things God was using to test our love and commitment to him. You have to keep giving. He said, in the midst of a very severe trial, 
In the midst of trial, we were talking about the just shall live by faith. They are overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able. Do you give as much as you are able or you give the barest minimum? And even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Don't wait until one pastor with sweet mouth come and uh, um, um, toast you to give. Walk, become a covenant partner with God in the closet, in your room. It is a mark of your love for God. He said, and they exceeded our expectation. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, a beginning to bring also to completion the act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we, are, and, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You cannot love without giving. This is what my husband and I practice. Because today is a day of testimony, that's why I had to share our own private testimony. And very soon I'm going to, um, we're going to have Lola Ademwago share our life experience as well. Because we want to be real with you. We loved God. We love God still. We are committed to his word. We're committed to giving to him. And then number three, three things to show your love for God. Love his word. Love to give to his work. Number three, passion for souls. Passion for souls. Ah, um, our heart for the lost sheep is a price for our love for him. Soul is God's greatest interest on earth. And he will pay anything to secure these interests. We love to win people to, to Christ. And we do this every day without shame. James chapter 5 verse 20. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. I told you about the story of Elizabeth in um, Luke, um, Elizabeth and Zachariah, in Luke chapter 1, verse 13. You can read that. But I will, I, will, I will just look at verse 16 of Luke chapter 1. It says, John the Baptist, it will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. That was the purpose. You cannot, you see, when we, those times I told you we were squatting, moving from one place to another, one of our friends said, okay, I have a better apartment. You come and stay here since you're going to England anyway. So he moved to my husband's one bedroom in his family house and we moved to his apartment. We were squatting there. And I said to myself, now nah, I didn't have a job. I, I mean, things were not going on well, but at least I know something. I can always win so because the book of Daniel says, anyone that turned many to righteousness will shine a star in heaven. So I figured out something like a football match that anyone that scores a goal, they will mention their name. That maybe they, as they mention my name in heaven, God will remember my case. So every day I would go and win a soul. I remember that particular night. I was about to sleep. I didn't know that I was already pregnant then. You know, you wouldn't know the first few weeks. I was naive. I didn't know. I wasn't feeling too good. I said, ah, I have not preached to someone today. I told my husband, please go with me. I went out. We went to preach to someone. And that day we had four souls. By the time we were living in a squatting neighborhood, we had had 16 converts. Even with our meager resources, we had a little fellowship with them. And we took them to a church down our street and handed them over to that pastor and said, these are our converts. I pray, I hope that some of them or all of them are still in the faith. You see, you're not doing this because you want to populate a church. You're doing this because you want to populate God's kingdom. Because it is God's interest to have the whole world saved. The Bible says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all. And then the end will come. We are irrevoc irrevocably committed to this cause. It is a mark of our love for God. Your faith will never walk beyond your level of love for God. Great love for great level of faith. You want your faith to, to advance? You want your faith to progress? You need to deepen your love with God. That's number one point. I told you by one can be two. I said two points. The second point, treat your faith as a profession, not just a confession. You know, it's easy to see. I mean, there are so many born again cars, especially in Nigeria. 
it is well. Amen. Give us never lack. I'm a winner. Hey, I'm a whatever. I'm a fountainer. I'm a redeemer. I'm what, we have all sorts of stickers. Don't just make your faith a confession. Make your faith a what? A profession. In a university, confession, I will regard confession as a unit. A unit course. But if you really are going in to study medicine, first of all, you have to do physics, chemistry, biology, and maths or so for work. You have to pass. You have to score like some 290, 300 in jam. Then you go in. Then when you go in, you will go through, you know, faculty of science before they now send you, you know, to the medical school. Then when you are done with the six years, you will still do housemanship. You understand? Then you will now do NYSC. But you are still a junior doctor. If you really want to be a consultant, you will still go and apply again. You understand? Then you now become a junior registrar. And then you walk and walk and walk and walk until you become a consultant. That is how you should treat your faith. Why do I know that? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Many of us, we are just tongue-talking confessors. We live on milk. We are still in kindergarten. We are still in elementary. And we say, oh, it is not working. Habakkuk said it is not working. But he had trained himself to hear God. And he said, I will also train myself to wait until he speaks to me. And I will understand what he will say. When was the last time you say, I would know. I would wait. How can you discern what he has said? You don't know what he said about where to walk. You don't know what he said about what to give. You don't know what he said about, you know, where to relocate to. But... God said to us, we did everything we wanted to do to make sure we went to England. But God frustrated it because that was not his purpose for our lives. Maybe he had our children in mind. Maybe even their children's children because we do not live for ourselves. You have to get to that point where you ask God. Jesus got to that point. He had to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, you know what? God, how I wish that this cup would pass over me. Then by the time he prayed for one hour, he said, not my will, but yours, Lord. We have to get to that point. Our faith is not just religiosity. It's our relationship with God. So in the course of our waiting, we have to learn to persevere. When in doubt, you have to keep praying. Praying always with all supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, you know, for all the saints, you have to keep praying. Proverbs 24 verse 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. You can't afford to faint. You can't afford to give up now. Okay? So that I will not spend all the time. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to hand over. But I'm going to leave you with this word. For single ladies, don't be pressurized to have sex before marriage. Don't do it. There's never a right way to do a wrong thing. There's no justification for sin. Say, does that mean I'm going to die as a single person? So be it if that is what God wants. They don't use marriage certificates to enter heaven. And a married person is not better than a single person. There are many horrible, nasty married people. Don't let culture limit you and make you to think that your life is incomplete because you are not married. A woman is a gatekeeper of sex. The woman is the price and men are the hunters. So they are pursuing you. They like to chase. Let them chase you only into marriage. If you give in, then you are like a car that has been test driven. When a woman test drive with sex, they end up being driven. When you go to a car mall, you want to, tell, you want to buy a car. They tell you to test, test drive. You know, I just went through that ordeal like a, a week or two ago. I was trying to help a young man buy a car. And so every, every shopping, um, every car mall he goes to, he will test drive. And then he didn't buy the car. It would test drive. And then it didn't buy the car. Hey, women, stop being test driven. Let the real dude come. And when it comes, let him do the right thing. Stop gambling with your life. I said that to the ladies. But I know some men are watching. So for the men, let me give you this word. I said you need to know your life purpose before you propose. Don't just look for a woman that will come and help you. Help you with what? One of my mentors said this, and I'm going to quote it. He said, if you give a man, a woman, before he understands his work, it will ruin the world. So men, zip up your pant. You can exercise self-control. You can't die if you don't have sex. Just know that you need to learn. The same way we learn to love God, you can learn to control yourself. And to all, single or married, it is right to desire marriage. It is right to desire children. 
It is right to desire wealth. I had been so poor, but now I'm not poor like that any longer. So I understand it is good to be rich. A man is rich, however, not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. This pandemic has taught us so much about that. A man is rich, not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. What are the things that you've been able to do without in this season? Start evaluating them. Visualize on your dream, everyone listening to me. Focus on the possibilities. Act and participate in your dream as if it is already happening. I saw that day when my children would graduate. All of them in flying colors. And the Lord did it. The Lord will grant the hard desire of the righteous. And the expectations of the righteous will not be cut short. I pray for you that you will not lose your faith. And you will not sink in this valley. You may not see the wind. You may not see the rain. But your valley shall be filled. Let me stop because I want to give room for our great a guest speaker that is coming up. I'm going to hand over now to Tutu. Tutu is all the way in England. Who will be introducing Lola Ademowagun. Over to you, Tutu. <laughs> 